So my presentation is not uh, led by a written text. I will share with you some slides and some images to start. Oh, sorry. I don't know if everyone of you is familiar with this Charlie Hebdo picture. It was uh, released after the earthquake in Amatrice, Italy, on 2016, and was deeply uh, polemic, the debate that was raised by this picture, because it used very cultural stereotypes about Italians, and Italians uh, felt very hurt from this kind of manifestation of freedom of, of speech. This is one is the Frog of Kippenberg. It's an artistic opera in which we have a crucifix substitute from a frog with a, a, a mug. It is the author crucified by this alcoholic dependence. And uh, you see how the religious symbols is used in a harmful way for religious persons but as the, the European Court of Human Rights has said, crucifix is also a cultural symbol. So it's a, a plurisemantic symbol that can be used in many ways. As like in this other picture, in this other artistic opera by Maurizio Catelan, called Untitled, we, now we have the nature symbolized by the, the horse with the written text, Inri, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, that is on the crucifix also. And so is this crucifixion of nature while the human be, human, uh, humans are looking without doing anything. Another, another type of using the religious symbols in a probably harmful manner for religious persons, but uh, for sure is an artistic expression, is a manifestation of thought. Again, another crucifix, used in another way to condemn globalization and capitalism. And it's from a Finnish artist, Janele Inonen, and was a spokes in, in IFA. Many people claim for uh, closing this exhibition because of these symbols, but they failed. <laughs> and now, the famous Charlie Hebdo pictures, Many of us are familiar with the Islamic representation, but these are, this is on the Catholic Church, because uh, in this sense, Charlie Hebdo was a very democratic journal, because it was depicting all the main uh, religions. It was very equal in treating all of them. For sure, these are dis disturbing pictures, because for example, in the, left stand, in the left side, you see the Trinitarian dogma vilified by this journal. But this is, the question is, these are offenses criminally relevant? Because this is the point. How we can restrict this form of a manifestation of thought? And it is good to restrict this manifestation of thought which are the means that we can use, the legal tools that we can use in any case, maybe to restrict those, because we can speak about the clash between religious freedom, freedom of expression, but at the end we, can, we have to decide, we have the moral responsibilities as academics to find legal tools useful for the judiciary, to manage reality, because we can dis dis uh, discuss among each other uh, in these sessions about what we de can define as freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, freedom of religion, and so on. But at the end, someone has to judge this situation. And these are the famous Islamic pictures. Maybe you are more familiar with this. These are others. You can see it is also uh, Judaism in these other pictures. In this sense, Charlie Bedeau is a very democratic. This is the, the uh, picture released after the Charlie Hebdo massacre of the editorial staff. And you see St. Peter on the left. These are the cartoonists and the, uh, 
the, the, the brothers um, who made the, the uh, terrorist attack. And uh, they are winning on them, even in the other life, because they are making pee on them to testify that freedom of expression has not died, even in, in that uh, horrible situation. After this uh, quick, quick list of images, I, can, I want to fix the term of my presentation. So we have two basic rights, freedom of expression and freedom of religion, that, are, that needs to be equally equally protected, and so needs to be balanced in a democratic legal system. So we have to find models to combine these two, uh, um, these two basic rights, take, um, take, um, having in mind that satire, heart, are a form of expression, and at least can be uh, defined also as a form of freedom of religion themselves, like blasphemy, as uh, Jérôme has already quoted in his presentation. So, satire is a very complex word, because in, uh, in now, nowadays it's basically inside the pictures or something like that, but it's also a, general, a literary genre. Plauto, Giovenale, and uh, Satiricon of Petronio Arbitro are examples of ancient opera of uh, satire attitude. So it's a very complex form of art that is not a mere representation through pictures, at least in the past. Nowadays, it's more combined with the iconographical power of pictures. And on the other side, we have hate speech. So the need to uh, restrict some forms of expression that could be hurtful to some person, at least when they um, hence, in inciting, promoted, justified, racial, religious hatred. So, we have the problem of models, as I, as I, I said before. Basically, we have two ways, and one of the two is split in two. But the, the uh, older model is the model of blasphemy laws, insult to religion, and uh, censorship that used as a tool, for example, the crime of blasphemy. And the problem is uh, the, at stake is what we have to protect in a model like this. One religion, every religion, who has to be protected? And non-believers, where we put non-believers? Because in a system like that, non-believing could be also seen as a form of blasphemy. So, is a riskful system, as, as Jeroen has already said, it was quite abandoned almost everywhere. The second possibility is instead to protect persons who profess a religion. And to, we, here we have two basic models, one more devoted to protect uh, freedom of speech, like in the US, when you can restrict freedom of speech where to uh, when it becomes a, a sort of uh, making the crime in, uh, with the person who are materially making that instigation that is uh, acknowledged by the acts of the, peop of, uh, of the people. And we have the only limit of criminal law. But also in this model there is a risk, the risk of no promotion of the collective rights because groups of people believing, believers, Fails, um, feel unprotected from the system. It is also a, not a good thing because uh, it uh, uh, nurtures social conflicts. So people have to find uh, in the law uh, at least the sensation of being protected and considered from the law itself, from the system. Otherwise, the nurturing the social, the social insecurity could lead to problem of social peace, but not in the sense that uh, my colleagues were arguing uh, before. In, it, it depends very much on the situation of the nation. The system functioned very well in the US because of the First Amendment and the culture 
of the First Amendment of that particular environment. Instead, for example, in India, in the Indian model, even if the Constitution is shaped on the, Amer on the American one, and so the concept of freedom of speech that the Constitution wants to be cool is the same almost, the application of this concept by the, the, the Indian Supreme Court is totally different because there, there is the need to keep the social peace, peace because of communalism or because of the religion riots that often uh, are, um, happen in, this, in that context. So the extent of freedom of speech is less that, that of the United States, even if the model is quite similar from a, a formal point of view, as a starting point. And then we have the European model. Basically, all the European states are in, in this model, uh, where we have the protection of individual rights balanced with the protection of the groups. And the law on hate speech tries to make this, to find a balance between the individual rights and uh, the um, collective rights. But now uh, comes the problems, because uh, we have spoken this, uh, this, uh, this morning about how to protect feelings, but what are religious feelings and who are the people entitled to claim for the protection of religious feelings. Every single individual believer, there are collective groups. This also was the problem behind the defamation of religion that was completely abandoned at international level because you have difficult in find what, which is the legal good protected by this kind of uh, criminal laws. Very often you end to end in it, have a crime without a, an offense, a tangible offense to the legal good protected. And uh, we have a legis on the other side, very often we have a legislation of a mere principle. So you have the rules, but nobody is adopting them. In which sense? In the practical sense. If you look at the jurisprudence of the single nations, I've made this check on the Italian one and on the British one, the case that arrives in front of the courts based on a hate speech offense are few, very few. Why? Because the proof, you have the problem of the legal proof. When you, you are a public prosecutor, you have to go in front of the court and to, uh, to arguments, to, to put arguments about the proof, the intent, the offense, and how you can prove that these artistic, uh, for example, manifestation of thought, uh, going back to our pictures uh, at the beginning, were released with the intention of instigate hatred against a group or not. This analysis was done by the French courts on the Charlie Hebdo pictures even before of the 2015 case, but uh, they concluded that the was not possible to prove uh, a, an intent of this kind. So it's a legal problem to design a rule in a very effective way, using rules, because from a theoretical point of view, it could be possible to create an offense of hate speech, as was, uh, for example, designed by the recommendation of uh, the Council of Europe, of Europe's Committee of Ministers, but is everything inside the definition? Almost everything you can put inside that. From a, the, the criminal law as um, leaves on very strict principle that are, are guarantees from the individual taken in front of a court. And we can skip from them. Otherwise, we, cr we create a subjective criminal law that is a threat to democratic society. We have to be stuck to an objective conception of criminal law. For sure, there is the necessity to protect human dignity. And the human dignity is the core of arguments in this kind of, uh, uh, in this kind of topics. As Waldron said, 
A person who suffers hate speech is humiliated. From him is humiliated all the, uh, the group who this person belongs. But in any case, you have to protect also the person who humiliates. And Jeroen also quoted some of the, uh, the, the decision of uh, the European Courts of Human Rights that goes in this way, but also the jurisprudence of the United, the United States Supreme Court goes always in this state since the, the case of Sacco e Vanzetti. And now we came to the last part of the presentation. We have time to. Uh, I will share with you some cases on this uh, supposed contrast between heart pictures and manifestation of thought and freedom of religion. This is an Austrian case. And you see the, the picture that was uh, incriminated in this case. There was a, a Hotto Mule Apocalypse opera. And you can see some uh, iconographic remounts to the Catholic religion again. And uh, in particular, in the, the one in the center in um, in the bottom, uh, was com um, related to a, a member of the National Assembly. So the cases start, this case started as a, a defamation case. In this case, of this person that was representing, the, there is also Madre Teresa di Calcutta in, the, in that picture that is used. But uh, the court also, in this case, said that uh, this was a manifestation of heart, and so the use of this language, religious language, even if it was, could be uh, conceived as heartful for believers, and uh, probably idoneous at putting in trouble the honor of this particular National Assembly member, was not to be restricted, because it was heart was a satirical use of art. And this led to a dissenting judge's opinion that said, OK, it would be art, but this does not mean that art has no limits. And you, because uh, we have to be careful also to say that art has to be saved every, every time. Otherwise, we are saying that there are categories of speech that are exempted from any appreciation from a, a judge. Instead, the court is saying that, uh, five minutes, okay, I'm gone. Ciao farò. Okay. That the, the, the point is that, okay, you can use heart, but you have to be careful because, uh, as said uh, in the Segmanians' case, there is the protection of public moral, but you have to be well aware that you have to motivate very, very, very careful of what public moral is in a certain context. In fact, in the Sad Magienzi's case, never, not, not even in this case, the court says that was enough motivated the public moral heart to lead to a restriction of the using of uh, uh, religious symbols in advertising campaign. And now we came to the last case that is of uh, yesterday, because it's of July 2000, uh, 2021. This is a Georgian case. There are, those are condoms, packaging of condoms, in which in four cases, in at least two of them free, they said, there is the use of uh, religious symbols of the Orthodox religion. Even in this case, the court says that religious feelings cannot be protected as they stand to restrict manifestation of freedom of speech and expression that could hurt them. Because otherwise, the problem is which religious feelings we have to protect. If we rely on the uh, susceptibilities, as said the colleague before, of certain groups in, instead of the others, uh, it's a very uh, sliding, uh, sliding way of thinking because uh, you shape the protection of a rights uh, 
balancing it, because, um, relating it to which person is affecting from the exercise of that right. We have, again, to have objective tools for the judiciary, not subjective tools. That is the point, basically. And so my conclusion is that criminal law is not the right tool to protect fundamental rights, even if because uh, criminal law arises late, when the offense is already there. Criminal law is not a mean of prevention. The history is clear in this sense. Since Beccaria said that uh, in the 18th century, in, uh, 18th century uh, you can't prevent social conflicts using criminal tools because you are failing in that. You have to use other means, also because criminal law is never culturally neutral because the product of the culture of that state, the product law in that particular historical moment. Religion and moral sensitivities are diachronic concepts. They're moving in history. So you can't design a rule that can work 10 years ago and 20 years ahead, probably, because society from, from now to 20 years will be totally different. And what is moral today is not moral tomorrow. And this is why my proposal is using ethical codes, codes, for example, for journalism, and the uh, meaning of restorative justice in case of conflict with clashes between groups, and using education, but in another sense, in respect of uh, the colleague said in the opening lecture, education in the sense that new generation has to be uh, educated in conceived fundamental rights, because in our Western society, fundamental rights are taken for granted, and no one is explaining to the new generation what is the content, the fundamental content of fundamental rights. It's not the right to do everything you want, but you, you have the right to do what is allowed to in the respect of the other. This is a basic concern to prevent conflict of fundamental rights. And now I will leave you with a famous Italian poet, Alda Merini, that uh, said, mi piace chi sceglie con cura le parole da non dire. I love who chooses carefully what to say. That does not mean censorship or self-censorship. You can say whatever you want. This is for granted in our society. But you have to choose carefully how to say it. Because basically, there is the problem, now we have no time to uh, go in, in details in this, but the code of the transmission of the message is fundamental in the plural society. To vehicle in a good way, even hurting ideas. Because you have to say what you think. Because you are allowed to. But if you say it respectfully of the other, so even using the code of the sacred symbols, but not in a disturbing way, like in the Austrian one, because for sure this is disturbing. Less disturbing is this one. I can feel hurt, but yes, for sure there is a desacralization of the symbol, but not in a heartful way. So you can use everything. But you are in a plural society, so we have to be aware of the responsibility that we have even in, in manifesting our thought. And Article 10 says, in effect, in the European Convention of Human Rights, that freedom of expression carries duties with them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have more questions, more <laughs> things to think about right now, but it's good. <laughs> and so, well, now we have 
around 10 minutes to, for questions regarding both uh, interventions. So, uh, I don't know who would like to begin with the questions. Okay. Mm. I have a question right now. <laughs> uh, you mentioned as one of the alternatives the, the ethical codes for journalists. I think that there are many, many ethical codes for journalists, but uh, still they are not somehow working. So what's, what kind of code, ethical code, do you think would be a, a good one? And who is the one who decides the limits of this ethical? Because we are, I think, in the same situation that uh, we are always thinking about, okay, but what is possible to, to say and what is good to say and what is not good? It's like a very difficult limit between one thing and the other and at the, uh, the last moment, the main thing is who is the one who decides? So, if you can comment on that. Okay. Um, for, first of all, ethical codes have some the board that can uh, use it and can decide. For example, the journalist order has the right to implement the ethical code of journalism, at least in Italy, but I think that is the same almost everywhere. The problem is also to be aware of the journalist about the risk of communication. Very often in our society, we are uh, very keen on uh, the right to say but not uh, on, it's the same discourse as before, on how to say it. It's not a matter of fact to restrict the freedom of journalism, but to uh, make a, an education process also inside the boards to uh, make aware the public actors about the problem of the responsibility that the, the language has. In the pluralistic society, in the globalization, uh, the message is very quick in reaching all the, uh, the possible targets. And when we say something in our society, we completely lost the control of what we say. In the moment in which a news is published, the journalists fail to control it. But because it's uh, physiological, to the means that we use. If you put something on the internet, in, in one moment it reaches 1,000 people, 100,000, and you can, cannot be aware of what is the uh, effect that this news is doing. So I think that the, uh, the work of the boards is not, not only in deciding on cases of violation of the, uh, the ethical code, but uh, very hard work has to be done about uh, education of people at all levels, about uh, the awareness, about the risk of communication. So I think that the person who has to decide is the ethical board of each uh, uh, order, uh, for example, for, for, um, for teachers also, uh, in the university also. Uh, but uh, um, I think that the work is on education. Again, ah. which code you said? Which code is the better one to you, to be used? Uh, I think I yeah, but, but I think that, please, okay. please, no, 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 it's fine. I think that there is not a, a formula. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it depends also on the cultural envir environment of that particular state. Thank you. So uh, the thing that I have in mind right now is that if is the board the one who is uh, each board, the one who is deciding, we can find in a situation of the one that you mentioned, more or less, that there are some situations in which there are impositions of the correct way to think. And so we, we can, again, be in a situation in which we, we are like in a circle. We, don't take, we cannot take a decision or we cannot... Uh, decide on which, um, which aspects do we, we want to protect because uh, maybe there are cultural groups that are deciding for us and imposing us their vision. So I don't know if you would like to comment on that. 
<laughs> you, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. You were saying that uh, nowadays, very often, uh, there are groups that are imposing visions of man, of the person. This, the, what you mentioned, the liberalist, uh, liberalist authoritarianism. Yeah. And I think that this kind of authoritarianism can be also imposed as a way, uh, in a way that can try to make us uh, put the limits regarding, for example, these uh, ethical codes. So we can be in a situation in which these boards, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm right what I'm thinking, are you thinking aloud <laughs> that yeah. these codes that are being decided by the boards, they can, the boards can be under a big pressure yes, 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 yes. or they are, can be the ones who are putting pressure on the, on the journalists. So I am a bit afraid that we are in a cultural situation in which there, are, there, are, there is no really freedom to take the, this kind of decision that make things work in a more no authoritarian way. Well, yes, I can comment a little bit on that, but basic, basically I agree with, with, with what you are saying. So the codes imposed by the boards, the, so in general the canon, the, the different, different rules established by the authorities to concretize sometimes uh, what kind of a speech is tolerable and which one it is not exactly. All that kind of codes, and in the universities is very clear, the, the codes that are created, the speech codes that are created. I mean, even in the case law, of the, my previous concern had to do also with these kinds of things when I was discussing the problem of a, of a public peace as a public peace as a reason or as the criterion to protect or to deny the protection of free speech. Also that kind of uh, codes or that kind of criterion, criteria tend to be biased many times. There is a, in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, for example, I have in mind two cases, Le Pen versus France, the contrast between Le Pen versus France of 2010 and Erbakan versus Turkey of 2006. Uh, I think 2006, well, maybe the dates are not exactly that, but in one of those cases, in the case of Erbakan, Erbakan had been the leader of the party, Rafa Partisi, of an extreme Islamist party. And he had, in a public meeting, he had just uh, appealed, he had invoked, uh, well, he had accused basically all the parties who were not his own one. He was accusing all the parties of being against Allah and of uh, being infidelly unfaithful and very, very, very harsh accusations and attacks. And he was condemned. He was imposed a penalty, well, not a penalty, uh, he was con convicted one year for that. The European Court of Human Rights reversed the decision saying that it was a violation of the free speech because of the situation, it did not create enough public peace problems, etc. Well, he, basically he was protected by free, by free speech. Whereas in the case of Le Pen, he just said that speaking about the Muslims, it can be, of course, his statement can be criticized, but the statement was this. When they are the majority, they are being charged. That was his statement, talking about the Muslims in France. Of course, that may be criticized, but it is a much softer speech than the one of Erba Khan. And he had been imposed a, a fine. He had been imposed a fine by the administrative authorities in France. And he was convicted because he created, on the, on the basis that he could create a public affair, a public issue, or a problem of public peace. So that code is biased when it is applied, and not only when it is applied, of course, in the case of the boards, the particular codes created in, different, in the boards or in the universities, they may also be biased, and that's a way of imposing that authoritarian liberalism. So, yeah, it's, I basically agree with what you are saying. Well, is the, what also you mentioned is real, uh, that uh, theoretically we can discuss but then in practice, it's really very difficult. So yeah, there are different alternatives that you are trying
trying to. Just add one thing. I think that the old categories of slander, injury, what I was saying, they do not protect subjectivity. And it, I think it is much easier to apply those categories in the real world when a judge comes to discern whether there is a, an insult or not. It is easier to say whether there is an insult than to say, than to apply these categories of hate speech. So actually, or those codes. So traditional, those traditional categories, they convey, they are much more meaningful uh, in the common citizen. But they are, ironically, those categories are criticized as being subjective, as fostering the protection of uh, susceptible subjectivities. That's false. They are much more clear. So everybody knows what's an insult. Mm. And everybody distinguishes an insult from the protection of, a, of an extreme subjectivity or extreme sensibility, an excessive sensibility. Whereas, who knows what is hate speech? It's much more difficult to discern in the real life what is hate speech, I think. So. Well. We are going because I'm sorry I didn't realize that we are late. And no, aren't we? Oh, we are perfect. <laughs> so, okay, thank you very much.